9, and 10 as well. You can go ahead and start opening up there. <clears throat> I was sitting over there, and just my legs started twitching. 7 o'clock, and Charlie wasn't up there. <laughs> I need every minute. Uh, I'll fill it anyways, doesn't matter how much I get. Um, so the purpose of tonight, we're going to take a look at chapters 8, 9, and 10. We may get into 10. We'll find out how much I talk about 8 and 9. Um, is this is the consecration of the priesthood. Up until now, we've had Moses and Moses, and also Moses with Moses. Uh, and that's it. Uh, if you read back through the first seven chapters, the Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, and Moses did what the Lord said. The Lord said to Moses, go tell Aaron this. Uh, so there's no communication at that point between God and Aaron. Everything's taking place outside the camp. They're in that tent of meeting that was described in Exodus. Uh, and that's where this is happening, where God and Moses speak like friends face to face until chapter 8. And in chapter 8, this is the beginning of actually having the priesthood. Now, in chapter 8, it's still Moses' show. Really, it's not till the next two chapters that we get the Aaron show. Uh, so this is still the Moses show, but this is a very interesting chapter to me. Uh, hopefully, it's interesting to you because this is how God made his priests. This is what God thought would be good symbolism. This is what God thought would be a good way for the, the Jews to think this through of how someone from the common pool, because at this point Levi is nothing more than a promised, you're going, to be, you're going to be different than anybody else. From this, this normal pool of Jews, how do you elevate someone like this? And so there's going to be some things here that are a little different. Some of the sacrifices that we've learned, all the rules that I drilled into your head, some of them get modified <laughs> because this is a unique occurrence, the ordination the consecration of the priesthood. Okay, so let's talk about the first four verses here. The Lord spoke to Moses and he said, Take Aaron and his sons with him and the garments and the anointing oil and the bull of the sin offering and the two rams and the basket of unleavened bread and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him and the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Where are they assembling? At, at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Which tent of meeting? Because in this chapter, it's ambiguous. Because at the beginning of the chapter, you're like, oh, it's the same tent they've been using the whole time. It's the one that's outside, this, outside of the camp. They all went out there and they did it. But then Moses is doing a ton of stuff right where they are to the tabernacle. And then all of a sudden, Aaron and his sons are going to be commanded not to leave the tent of meeting. Well, that doesn't sound like outside the camp. That sounds a lot more like tabernacle. Even at one point, it's called tabernacle when Moses goes and does some things to it. So I'm not going to argue necessarily either way, but I want you guys to decide for yourselves of which tent of meeting he's at. Um, I can make really strong arguments on both sides, so I'm sure you can as well. So you can, you can figure that one out. God gives some instructions. He tells Moses to gather some things together. What is he supposed to be gathering? Some garments. We have special garments. Yep. What else? Oil. Yeah, don't forget that. We've got a bowl. We've got unleavened bread and two rams. All of these things are to be brought together. So, knowing what we know, he has brought a bowl of the sin offering. What kind of sin offerings could he be offering? Offering it for whom, I guess is my question. Aaron and his sons. Aaron and his sons is one option. The congregation. the congregation is the other option. Aaron and his sons is the one he's doing here, but I wanted both answers because they're both bulls. Um, so this is going to be special. It's going to be a little different than if just the normal Jew comes and brings in a bull or brings in an animal for a sin offering. This is going to be special. You'll notice the specialness as we go along. He brings in two rams and a basket of unleavened bread. Because there's a basket of unleavened bread, what are at least one of the rams going to be used for? What kind of sacrifice? Let's see how heavy did I drill it in? Mm, nope. He 
Peace offering has some. You're, you're on the right track. But he's only bringing the one thing. Peace offering has several. So that's got to be a burnt offering. Because if you stand before God and you don't have this with you at this point in time, we're going to be in trouble. He's also going to use it for the sin offering, or, or for the ordination ramp, but we're not going to talk about that either. Okay, very good. The phrase, and Moses did as the Lord commanded, or as the Lord commanded Moses, is used a whole bunch in this chapter. I didn't count because it's a lot. Uh, every end of paragraph as I go along, you're going to see as the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay, so they get everything together. Moses says to the congregation in verse 5, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons, and he washed them with water. Now, this may be utilizing the, the bronze basin that has water. It may be utilizing some other source of water, because if they're outside of the camp at that tent of meeting, there's got to be a different source of water. Uh, if they're inside, then they're using the holy water. I hesitate to say they're using the holy water for one simple reason. They aren't holy yet. But they're still unclean. And so they've got water. They have to be washed. They have to get everything off of them. Describe for me the kind of outfit Aaron has to wear. What's some of the parts to his attire? It's from 7 and 8. Tunic. Okay, we've got a tunic, so he has a special kind of tunic that he has to put on. What else? We've got a robe as well, because he's got layers he's got to wear. All of it needs to be tied together with the sash. So we've got this, this binding of himself going on. So we have an underlayer, we have an overlayer, we have a sash bringing it all together. What's he supposed to put on top of the robe? Yeah, he's got to have a kind of vest. Uh, the ephod is going on here. Uh, the urim and the thummim are going to be on the breast piece that's placed on the, on the ephod. Okay? What's he have on his head? A turban and... What's on the turban? A crown. I don't know how many of you guys stop and think about the fact that every single high priest, when he's wearing his high priestly attire, is wearing a crown on his head. But can you say high priest and king? Like, the symbols were there. Uh, when we talk about Christ being our high priest and our king, he is literally just describing what Aaron wore. Like, that's it. Now, Aaron does not behave as king. He is only high priest. He's not a Melchizedek. He's not a Jesus. He's just Aaron. So he's only a high priest. But he still wears a golden crown. If you want to know more about the golden crown, you can take a look in Exodus. It describes what's on it and so forth and so on. But just suffice it to say, he is now in his full high priestly attire. He has been cleansed. He is not holy yet. He's almost holy. It's all in one day. Anybody got any questions or thoughts? Different than the one in chapter 4 in terms of what they did with the meat? Uh, it does seem to be different, yes. Um, just because in chapter 4 it doesn't describe exactly what they do here. Uh, ordination day is, is a little bit different for sacrifices. Uh, yeah, you're definitely on to something there. Yeah? You know, think about it, there's a lot of religious groups, especially the Catholics, they go through this kind of ceremony with the Pope, and he wears a crown everywhere he goes. Yeah. And I, I'm wondering if they do the same kind of ceremony, you know, when they pick a new Pope, and he stays inside for several hours and then comes back out. I wonder if they incorporate that. They might have. Um, possible. I really don't know much about choosing the different pope, other than they stay inside and they change the color of the smoke when one's selected. That's, that's, what I, that's what I know. Any other comments? Okay. Moses takes the anointing oil. Where does he take the anointing oil? What's he do with it? Give me the first thing he does with it. He goes to the tabernacle. He anoints the tabernacle itself he anoints all the things that is in the tabernacle. He goes to the altar. He does something special with the altar. What's he do there? Sprinkles it seven times. This is a very special place. 
Everything inside the tabernacle is holy and it is special, but this altar is special. Probably the, 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 the bronze altar of, of burnt offerings. It, you, you could make an argument for the incense altar there. I don't think it's as strong, um, but you know, you can make up your mind. Uh, he anoints all of the utensils that are going to be used. He anoints the basin. He anoints the stand. He consecrates everything. And then he turns back to Aaron and the sons. And what's he do with the oil with Aaron? He anoints him. Now, up until now, it says he takes the anointing oil and he sprinkles some of it on the altar, probably by, you know, reasoning. He's sprinkling it on everything else because it's hard to pour oil onto the whole tabernacle. So it's, it's ceremonial. But he gets down to Aaron and he pours some of it on Aaron's head and anoints him and consecrates him. The anointing with oil is all over scripture. It's just everywhere. Kings, priests, prophets, like it, it's just all over the place, the anointing of it. Um, this makes you special. It makes you different. This person does not have oil. This person was not anointed. This person was not set aside for a special purpose. You were. Um, because you had the, the oil poured. Then we bring in the sons. What's Moses do with the sons at this point? He puts the tunics on them. What else? Sashes. And the hats. Probably more turbans. Some say caps. Uh, I read that it may be a different Hebrew word used there, so it might be slightly different. Um, they're not as flamboyant, are they? Uh, they don't have the stones, they don't have the gold, they don't have a crown, certainly, because they're not the leader. Notice the order as well. You can't have priests until there is a priesthood. And you can't have a priesthood until there's a high priest. Like, you have to have him first. So Aaron, deal, or Aaron is dealt with in its entirety. Then the sons can be brought in to serve with him. Any, other com any comments anybody has? The priests, sure? They're above the regular Levites, yeah. Yeah. Because at this point, they're the only priests. The five of them. <laughs> that's, that's all they got, yeah. Yes, they're above the regular Levites. Uh, once the tabernacle is set up pretty well, they are the ones running the show. Uh, the Levites can be involved in the setting up and the moving and the carrying and so forth and so on. But once it's up, it's, it's the priest's show. Okay. We've got him dressed. We've got him anointed. We've got him ready. But he is still not priest. Even though he looks like it, he's dressed like it. So what's the first sacrifice that has to be done? Verse 14. The bull. The bull of the sin offering. What is the purpose of a sin offering? To make you clean before God. Thank you for wording it that way. Instead of saying to get rid of your sins, because that's our normal response. Remember, we had that conversation last time. It's to make you clean again. It's, it's to take what, was, what has been separated and make it no longer separated. You're back with the people. You're back with God. You're back as one. So they do the bull of the sin offering. Who lays their hands on the head of the bull? Aaron and his sons. Going back to... What is it? Chapter 4 it talks about the sin offering. Only one time does a group of people lay their hands on the head of the bull or any of the animals. And what kind of sacrifice is that one? It's a sin offering, but for whom? The whole congregation. So notice we're mixing our, our, our offerings here. So we've got this is a special one because it's a bull. It's for the priesthood, all of them. So they all have to put their hands on they're all being consecrated. They're all having their uncleanness removed so they can be clean before God again. So a little bit of a deviation, right? Ordination day, consecration day, some of the stuff's a little different. Which is a whole side note, right? You know, in, in Scripture, they always talk, you, even Jesus talks about that, uh, you know, man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. You know, there's this thing in scripture, David eats the showbread. You can modify the law of Moses and be still right in the eyes of God. So we always think about it as written in stone and hard and fast and nothing ever changes and then God changes it in the very next chapter. Uh, still very flexible because it's still God's law. He uses it how he wants. Anyways, that was a side note. <coughs> 
In verse 15, it says, and he killed it. Who killed it? Moses. Thank you. Aaron's still a nobody. I know he looks the part. He's still a nobody. This is still Aaron or Moses leading all of the people. Moses kills it. Moses takes the blood. With his finger, he puts some of it on the horns of the altar, uh, purifying the altar. He pours out the blood at the base of the altar. He consecrates it to make atonement for it. He takes all of the fat that was on the entrails, the lobe of the liver, the two kidneys with their fat. He burns all of it on the altar. But the rest of it, the bull, the skins, the flesh, it's dung. He burns up with fire outside the camp as the Lord commanded Moses. Nobody eats this one except God. That's the point. Because it's a bull. And there is no one holy enough on earth to be able to eat it. Even though Moses is technically in the position of more holy than anybody else. But Moses is weird. Like if you're ever studying any time that Moses is alive, Moses is weird. He's a lawgiver. The lawgiver gets to break a whole bunch of rules. The lawgiver behaves in an entirely different way. He's almost outside of law because he gave it to you. That's Moses. Why can Moses walk around and touch the things that only Aaron gets to touch? Why can Moses walk around and offer sacrifices? Why can Moses walk in and talk to God? Because he's Moses. Like, that's his role. That's his job. So he continues to do all of these things. What do Aaron and his sons do? They stand there like the normals. And they watch. That's it. Moses is the priesthood at this point. Any comments on the sin offering? We had that question last time. It probably stabbed in some form. Uh, I know a lot of later ones, uh, like Middle Ages and the like, uh, when trying to capture blood, would use a bowl underneath, like especially with a bowl, uh, and slit the throat, and then kind of the bowl sinks as it dies. Um, so that's my best answer. Having dealt with a bunch of bulls, I don't think it's very easy to kill a bull. Yeah. Unless he, I mean, they, they either shoot him or they don't shoot him or they must have speared him or doing something. I'm just interested. I yeah. just wonder if history told us. It may be part of the miracle. Why in the world does a bull allow itself to be walked into a tabernacle area where blood is literally everywhere and sit there calmly while it is murdered? Maybe onto something. I have a bilingual version here, and the word that's used in Spanish is the word that is to slit the throat, the jugulars. Yeah. So at least that was that translator's understanding of it. Yeah. And it may very well be in the Greeks. I just I didn't look, or the Hebrews. I didn't, I didn't look it up. In English, it, we're boring. It just says kill. Okay. Let's talk about the next ram. Well, the first ram. In verse 18, he presents the ram. He calls it what? What kind of ram? The burnt offering, yeah. What is the purpose of a burnt offering? Thanksgiving. Okay, Thanksgiving definitely is involved in there. I call it the I love God offering uh, because it helps me remember that's its only purpose. I love God. I gave it to him. Uh, I'm not asking for anything. With the sin offering, I'm asking for something. With a peace, I'm asking for something. With a guilt, I'm certainly asking for something. But with a burnt, I'm not asking for anything. So note the progression. I've gone from a sin offering, I need to be made clean again, to thank you. Like, literally, thanksgiving, I love God, I can offer this now. Uh, Aaron and his sons again lay their hands on the head of the ram. Moses kills it. Moses throws the blood on the side of the altar. He cuts it in pieces. Uh, he does all the things he's supposed to do. He burns the head and the pieces and the fat and so on. He washes the entrails and legs with water. Uh, he burns the whole ram on the altar. It's a burnt offering with a pleasing aroma, a food offering for the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. So follows the law of burnt offerings. The second ram in verse 22 is called the ram of what? consecration. Some of yours will say ordination. There may be another word, but those are the two. I think that's good enough. This is the one that makes it so that they're going to go forward as priests. They're clean. They're in right standing with God. Now they are being made special. We haven't talked about a ram of ordination because this is the only time when they're making a priesthood. 
that they use a ram of ordination. They may use it when they make another high priest, you know, when Eleazar succeeds uh, Aaron. They might have done it. We're not told. It's not recorded for us. But, but they use it here. Aaron and his sons lay their hands on the head of the ram again. Moses kills it. Moses takes some of the blood, and he does something incredibly novel with it. What does he do to Aaron? Yeah, right? Right earlobe, right thumb. I know, I love the right big toe. Let's be specific. Yes. Why? Why does he do it? Well, that's an easy answer, right? Because God told him to. I mean, what did you take that from every time in this chapter when it says that Moses did what Lord, the Lord commanded? What kind of symbols does it say that God has done something special with blood on the earlobe, the thumb, and the big toe, all on the right side? God's right hand, yeah. Right hand is all over the place in Scripture, as this is the side of power. This is the side of God. So he consecrates the side of God. What do you think is significant about the fact that he took some blood that now makes him ordained, now makes him consecrated, and he puts it on his head? He's to think holy. Or you can be more specific. You're going to say he, the things that he hears is supposed to be holy. I can go with that too, because some commentators do. The things that he touches are now holy. The places that he walks are now holy. He is now holy by this sacrifice. What about the sons? Does he do the same thing? You better believe it, because otherwise they can't do the job that they're being created to do. They have to be different. They have to be holy. Think about as well, where do they put blood? They put blood on the side of the, the altar. They put blood on the horns of the altar. They throw blood at the holy of holies. They put blood on the horns of the altar of incense. These are some of the holiest places. And he put blood on his priests. They too are some of the holiest of things. And then Moses throws the rest of it on the side of the altar. Any comments before we move further? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I said at one point, if, if you're reading the Old Testament or you're reading the whole Bible and you think of Jesus, it's by design. Uh, <laughs> you're supposed to. Uh, so yeah, thinking of the rightness, uh, the right hand of God, the right, sitting at the right hand of God, thinking of Jesus that way, thinking of the fact that where he walks is holy, definitely think that way. Uh, verse 25, he takes the fat and the fat tail and the fat that was on the entrails, the long lobe of the liver, the kidneys, and so forth, the right thigh. Uh, he takes it out, uh, and out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he takes one loaf. Uh, he, there's also some additional kinds of bread at this point. So we've got the one loaf and the wafer and so forth because this is a wave offering that is being offered to the Lord. You can see that in chapter 2. Moses takes them from their hands. He burns them on the altar. This is the ordination offering with a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. Moses takes the breast. He waves it as a wave offering before the Lord. It is Moses' portion of the ram of ordination as the Lord commanded Moses. Isn't that cool? This unique sacrifice done in a unique way, and Moses has to eat some of it. Why does Moses have to eat some of it? Because it's holy. And he is holy. Think about that message right there. Aaron and his sons are supposed to eat of several kinds of sacrifices for the rest of their lives. Because they are more holy than the people. They're in that position. God put them there. But who is more holy than the priesthood? Moses, the lawgiver, he stands alone. Sure, he gets a priesthood to help. Sure, he gets judges to help him. But he stands alone. So when we talk about a prophet coming like Moses, and that prophet is Jesus, Jesus stands alone. He is king. He is high priest. He is over there. He has done sacrifices that you and I don't even get to participate in. 
much less be able to carry out. He is the lawgiver. After all, do we not call it the law of Christ and the law of Moses? <laughs> They're held out. Joshua does not pick up the status that Moses has. Yeah. He doesn't. He's leader, but he is not a lawgiver. He is a Jew like everybody else in the position of leadership. Exactly right. So in verse 30, Moses took some of the anointing oil and of the blood that was on the altar. He sprinkled it on Aaron and his garments, also on his sons and his sons' garments. So he consecrated Aaron and his garments and his sons and his sons' garments with him. Then we have from the 31 through the end of the chapter, Moses talks about what to do with some flesh. He says, boil the flesh at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Uh, there they are to eat it. Uh, and the bread that is in the basket of ordination as well. So clearly some portion of the ordination ram is also given over there, probably the right thigh that was mentioned a little bit ago, because oh, I know that was a big deal with, I think, the peace offering. So we may have some peace offerings coming in there as well. And there to boil it. This is the first time we really see any of how they eat it at the tabernacle. Uh, up until now, God just says, eat it. They boiled it. This is why in 1 Samuel, they're going to make a big deal about using incorrect implements when boiling, uh, when boiling the meat at the tabernacle. He gives them an order, verse 33. What is the order he gives to Aaron and his sons? Yeah, don't you dare leave this tabernacle for seven full days. You are to stay here. You are to do the work that God has given you. It says uh, in, in verse 33, uh, until the days of your ordination are complete, for it will take seven days to ordain you, as has been done today. The Lord has commanded you, uh, commanded to be done to make atonement for you. At the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged, so that you do not die. For so I have been commanded, and Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord commanded by Moses. Now, what did the Lord command him to do? Well, he was there. We don't know. I mean, I could give some guesses, but really because of the significance of chapter 9 and what happens on the eighth day, I don't get the impression Aaron and his sons do a lot of sacrifices. But that's not really what they're there for. What they're there for, I don't know. But because the eighth day is such a big deal, uh, they did something else. I don't know. I just don't. Any comments or thoughts? Yeah, it may have been a fast to get ready for what's about to happen because chapter 9 is the beginning of them. Like, they're going to start something here. Yeah, kind of like Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. Uh, I got baptized and pff, something's going to happen now. I got to go get ready. Yeah. Any comments before we get into chapter 9? Okay, chapter 8 was exciting for me. But chapter 9 is thrilling. Because in chapter 9, we have Aaron and his sons begin to do their priestly stuffs. And it's exciting. As we're reading through this, I want you to think about being Aaron, being his sons, and the excitement that is going on in the camp that you have a priesthood now, and they can do things. They're acting. And then we'll see at the end some more excitement that I'm sure Aaron feels. So on the, eighth day, Moses, uh, the, on the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering, a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. So this is for the priests. In verse 3, he says, Say to the people, Take a male goat for a sin offering, a calf and a lamb, both a year old without blemish for a burnt offering and an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. A little different, right? If you're going to offer a sin offering for the whole congregation, what kind do you use? You use a bull. What kind are they supposed to use here? A male goat. Well, who gets a male goat under the sin offering law? The leader does. So it's a little weird. 
Who came up with the idea? God did. This is what God wants. Uh, and it may be just to keep the symbols rather than necessarily that they're actually saying we were unclean and need to be coming back. I don't know. But that's what he does. God commands it, and so they do it. They also get together some stuff for a burnt offering. They get together things for a peace offering. They get together things for a grain offering. There are no guilt offerings because they haven't done anything that's serious for it, so they don't bring that in. So we're not talking about potential wrongness of an intentional nature. We're getting rid of the unintentional by these sacrifices. Uh, in verse 5, it says, They brought what Moses commanded to the front of the tent of meeting. All the congregation drew near. Moses said, This is the thing the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Moses said to, to Aaron, Draw near to the altar, offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, make atonement for yourselves and for the people, and bring the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord has commanded. So Aaron draws near. There is now a priesthood that is ordained, has been cleansed, is ready, is holy, and now they are really doing it. And Moses has to step back. Moses says, get going. But now he's out. Aaron has to take the lead. Aaron has to direct his sons. Aaron has to do the things that Moses just did a few days earlier. He has to already know what the law is. Makes me wonder if that's part of what they did during those seven days. If you better commit this to memory because it's about to get real. Uh, don't make a mistake here. Aaron draws near the altar. He kills the calf of the, of the sin offering. And his sons then prepare the rest. They get the blood ready. Aaron comes in. He dips his finger in. Uh, he puts the blood where the blood is supposed to go. They put the things of the sin offering on the altar where it's supposed to go. The flesh and the skin he burns up outside because this is for the priesthood. The priesthood has been made clean again. Think about that symbol. God says, you have been inside of the tabernacle for seven full days. The last thing that you did that we have recorded is you offered a sin offering for yourself to make yourself clean. You're unclean again. You haven't gone anywhere. You haven't touched anything. You haven't done anything other than stay in the holy places. You're unclean. Offer a sin offering. Reminds me a lot of Job. Uh, I'm going to offer the sacrifice. I don't know if they needed it, but I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, just in case one of my kids happened to have sinned. So just in case you're unclean, you bring a sin offering. And then you do it. Any comments anybody has? Sounds the only priest at this time. Because mm -hmm. they're the only sons of Aaron. And you got to have a son of Aaron in order to be a priest. I assume none of the sons have kids because it's never mentioned. So it's always possible that grandchildren are involved here. I mean, Aaron is kind of old. Like, there should be grandchildren alive, but it's not mentioned. Only the five of them are mentioned. Generation. By the time of Jesus, the Mishnah says there are 2,500 priests serving at the temple all the time. Yeah. I'm just, I can't imagine what, uh, keeping track, which I'm sure they did, their yeah. sons, that would be that many people. Yeah. Yeah, by then they had a rotation of priests. Yeah. Like, yeah. They didn't have enough room for people. Yeah. yeah. So, well, they got plenty of room for five. <laughs> yeah. And those five are going to be busy. Yeah. Uh, any comments before we start talking about the burnt offering? Yeah. Procreate a lot. It's true. So that the more priests you have, the more the work gets divided. All the priests have to have big families. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Practical application. Yeah. You got to think outside the box here. That's right. Think outside the tabernacle. Anyways. Uh, verse 8. No, verse 12. He killed the burnt offering. Aaron does. Aaron's sons hand him the blood. He throws it on the side of the altar. They then, it says, and they handed the burnt offering to him piece by piece. So we get the image of he himself is the one offering it on the altar. Uh, he lays it out. They, uh, he does the washing. He puts it up there. It is a burnt offering. It stays. This is for the priests. And then he presents the peoples. Can you just imagine the emotions going through Aaron right now? Like, okay, it's one thing to be you and God. That's, that's a huge deal, right? Uh, we even see that just with prayer. Prayer is so much simpler than this. Uh, and yet, in, in the New Testament, it talks often about trembling before the Lord when you pray. Like, that's a big deal. But now you 
are going to stand between God and them. And because of your actions, they are going to have a spiritual change on them. That's huge. Like, man, I, my hands would be shaken. Might have a little panic attack behind the burnt offerings altar. Duck back behind a curtain for just a moment. Like, think about this. He presents the people's offering. He takes the go to the sin offering. Uh, that was for the people. He kills it. He offers it as a sin offering, just like the first. He presents the burnt offering. He offers it according to the rule. He presents the grain offering. He takes a handful of it. He burns it on the altar like he's supposed to do. He kills the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings. Uh, Aaron's sons hand him the blood. He throws it on the side of the altar. The fat, it tells us, uh, of the ox and the ram, the fat tail, uh, and so forth and so on. They put up there onto the altar, but the breasts and the right thigh, Aaron waves as a wave offering before the Lord as Moses commanded. Meaning, who is keeping the breast and the right thigh now? Aaron is. Not Moses. Moses? Who's Moses? He's out now. The law has been given. The train has left the station. Moses is stepping back. And he stays up as leader. Uh, he's definitely a rebuker. He's certainly still a mediator, because there's a few times he's got to step in and say, God, don't do this. But by and large, it's, it's on Aaron now to lead these people. A man who very recently, by the way, uh, did a golden calf. <laughs> Aaron needed the urine to come. Mm -hmm. This is all new to him. And he, he probably said, uh, Lord, is it, what I'm doing, is this right? And he'd choose to do urine to Yes or no? Yes. That's true. I, I didn't think about that. Do I put the left one on first or the right one on first? Left one? Yes. <laughs> but you're right. He's got it right there because he is the voice of God. Okay. This is the first time Aaron and his sons have offered sacrifices, at the very least, as recorded in Leviticus. And something unique happens. Aaron, it says in verse 22, Aaron lifts up his hands towards the people. He blesses them. He came down from the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings, meaning he came down off of the altar. That's what's being described. Moses and Aaron, they go into the tent of meeting. When they come out of the tent of meeting, they bless the people and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Now, it's already on fire because they've already done sacrifices on the bronze altar. But this is new fire. This is fire coming out and God specifically showing who he is, that he approves, and that he ate their sacrifice. Because remember, these sacrifices are about meals they're pleasing aroma. They're sharing with God. And he ate his portion. Right there, I would imagine if I was Aaron, I, a little bit of the weight would probably come off and be like, oh, I did it right. It's okay. We're okay. We're fine. I'm sure off Moses' shoulders too, because, you know, he's been relaying all of this. But then we have chapter 10. We're going to come from the high of chapter 9. We have a priesthood. Aaron has been approved of. His sons are approved of. We now can come to God. We have a go-between. We have a mediator. We, the people, now have an avenue to the Lord. To chapter 10. So we got about eight minutes. So we're going to do a little bit of chapter 10, but probably not finish it till next week. And Nadab and Abihu, arguably the only two of Aaron's sons that any of us could rattle off the top of our head without stopping and thinking for a minute, and remembering Eleazar and Ithamar. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, they take their censer, they put fire in it, uh, and they laid the incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded. Some of yours will say strange. Uh, some of yours might say profane fire, meaning this is not where the fire was supposed to come from. This is incorrect. They have done wrong before God. Fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. I don't know how long between chapters 9 and 10. I don't. I think the way Leviticus is written is that we're not to assume a long period of time. Could be the next day, offering their sacrifices. 
It could be they let the fire go out on the incense altar, which was never to be let out, and they're like, oh, no, i got to get some fire and bring it in. Um, it could be a whole host of reasons of why this occurred. We'll talk about one of them probably next week when we get a little further in the chapter. But the point is they broke the covenant. They broke the law with God, and God was immediate. Why was God immediate? Why do you think? Very good. And for those of you who didn't hear, Rachel references Ananias and Sapphira. Great reference, beginning of the law of Moses, beginning of the law of Christ, beginning of the congregation of God, beginning of the congregation of God, both of which happens to have death right at the beginning because somebody did not, did not keep it. Because humans are stupid. I think I said this earlier. We're pretty stupid. Uh, we don't really see spiritual things like we're supposed to. So if you want to understand the consequence of breaking God's law, God kills you. We can get that. We all understand that one. Yeah. Example, you used the word intentional versus unintentional. This was intentional. Okay. This is pretty deliberate. Uh, there's no misunderstanding. I got the wrong stuff and came in with it. I've gotten out of this, too, that I think that we need to apply to us in our relationship and obedience to God and the way that our children should obey us is it, it specifically says fire which he had not commanded them. Yeah. It doesn't say that they used the wrong fire. It says fire which he had not commanded. He didn't tell them don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. He said do this. And they did something else. He doesn't have to tell us all the things that we can't do. He just has to tell us what to do. And that's what we should do. Exactly. It's, a, it's, it's a really hard concept a lot of times for kids to grasp. But I think it's a hard concept a lot of times for adults to grasp. And people want to wiggle around that all the time. Well, God didn't say not to do that. Well, Nadab and Abihu didn't even get to make that argument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It goes on to say in the sight of all the people, God will be honored. Yes. We can bring it forward to we do not do what God tells us to in our worship, God is not honored. Yes, exactly right. Any other comments? Oh, I got a whole bunch. Yeah, in the back and then. Oh, these were sons of Aaron. Yes. And, I mean, that tells me that just because your father is an evangelist or an elder or whatever, it don't matter what you do is bad, you go suffer. Yeah, God will still kill you. Yeah, Dick? Well, with the case in the New Testament, of course, that was special. <coughs> God's tabernacle, if they went inside that tabernacle, that's God's turf, and they better obey the laws. For instance, a yeah. penalty for going into the Holy of Holies, other than the high priest, was death. Here, yeah. that's the reason they tied a rope around the high priest's ankle, because they couldn't go in there and get him if he died. They had to pull him out. <laughs> they thought of everything. Any other comments? Let's get that last verse in there, verse uh, 3. Moses says to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. That's such a small sentence. Aaron held his peace. Aaron is mad. Aaron is sad. Aaron is raging. Like, there are so many emotions in this chapter, uh, especially from Aaron. Because what would you think here? God has made you special. He's put your, you and your sons in this special position. He's given you so much responsibility and so much authority, and then they make one little mistake, and you killed them. Aaron has already proved that he has a, a, a rocky relationship with God. We'll word it that way. What do you think that did to him? And who is the one that has to step in and save the day? Moses. Jesus has to step in and save our lives all the time. <laughs> like, 
His sacrifice saves us all the time. I don't even know all of the things that he has to go and be high priest for for me. Like, just think about that. How many times does our lawgiver have to stand up and say, okay, hold on. We need to get back in order. Because he's mad. But remember, I called this class God's definition of holiness. This is holy. I have told you what to do. If you don't do it, you're out. Like, that's it. We spent a bunch of time talking about all the mercy uh, of these sacrifices and how God was very caring. And, and if you did something unintentionally, it was all there. But you got an intentional sin. Like, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. I'm going to keep quoting Hebrews. Because it's the most clear and concise. If you go on sinning willfully after coming to the knowledge of the truth, there is no sacrifice for sin. That's straight out of Leviticus. And that's straight out of Nadab and Abihu's lesson. Any other thoughts? Yeah. The people who either observed it or heard of it. Because even those who had already been anointed to do wrong. And what they did wrong was so simple. Yeah. It would be so easy to not have done it. Yes. All right. We're going to stop here. Well, I'm going to wrap up here. I'm going to ring the buzzer here in just a moment. So next time... We're going to be taking a look at chapters 21 and 22, which talks about the holiness of priests and how they're to interact. Uh, and we're going to finish off chapter 10, beginning about verse 4. Uh, because, yes, this is an awful story, but this also is an important story to a priesthood. What in the world are we supposed to do if somebody dies in the holy areas? That's a problem. That's something they have to deal with here. Uh, and something that up until now God has not addressed. And so that has to be addressed. What am I supposed to feel while doing my priestly duties? How am I, as a father, supposed to react to the death of a son? Just think about it. Even if your son gets a heart attack and dies, or your father gets a heart attack and dies while serving as a priest, what am I supposed to do? Am I done for the day? Like, can I take the rest of the day off? Can I go home? These are all questions that have to be answered. So next time we'll finish chapter 10. We'll get into chapters 21 and 22. Uh, so go ahead and do those questions to kind of prepare your minds uh, for what we're going to discuss. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and be dismissed.